Hello everyone, welcome. My name is Dr. Sarah Chidaberijo. I am a researcher, lecturer, and media preneur. You're welcome to the third episode of our series, A Basic Guide to Doing Research. This episode is sponsored by Ellen Hub. Please do well to subscribe now and click the notification bell so that when we upload the other episodes, you'll be the first to know. Also remember to engage with our content. If you have a question, leave it in the comment section, we'll get right back to you. If you also have not watched the other episodes, episode one and two, the links are up there now and it's a good time for you to watch it. This is a journey. It's important that you start from the beginning until the end. Okay, so in this third episode, I'll be sharing with us some of the practical steps that we have to take before we begin our research journey. The three things we'll be looking at include choosing a topic or a subject to investigate. The second is choosing a research supervisor. And then lastly, we'll be talking about keeping a research diary. These three elements are so important. Let's dig in. Choosing the right topic or the right subject area or the right problem is the singular most important step you practically take before you embark on the research journey. I cannot emphasize this enough. It's important that you pick the right topic. And the first thing I'd like to say here is you have to be interested in that subject, in that problem. Else, hmm, you may not be able to complete the project, especially for those doing, say, a PhD research. It's important that you investigate things that you're really passionate and interested in because you need the grit to sustain you for a three-year, four-year, or even five-year period. But just generally, it's important that we think about a topic that we can identify with, something that drives us, something that we, we sleep at night and we think about. Because that way, you will not lose the steam required to complete your journey. Also note that in terms of picking a topic, you may be restricted. If, for example, you study mass communication or communication arts, it's important you know that when you're presenting your final projects in most academic institutions, that you have to pick a topic within your subject area. So it's important that even as you study, and that's why this um, um, lesson here is for everyone, for every student, because you never know when you'll be asked to do some kind of research project. For most, it's towards the end of their program. For others, you may be working and you still need to apply these steps. The right topic, the right subject, and understanding that sometimes you may be restricted in terms of your choice is really, really important. But no matter how the restrictions are, also know that every discipline is quite versatile. There are areas that you must definitely um, have some interest in. So please, Pick a topic that you're interested in. The second thing I'd like to mention is you need to know the rules and the regulations. And this is calling out to institutions to always ensure that they have a guide for students to follow. Well-documented, written, if there are institutions out there or you own the university and you need help, Ellen Hope will be able to supply and kind of encourage you and help you build a guide for your students to follow. It's important that students, for example, know how many words that their thesis is supposed to be, the kind of reference style that they are to apply, or the pagination, the use of words, uh, what are the reference styles, what, what kind of general information do they need to document, how is the document supposed to look like, what color is the cover, and so on and so forth. These basic things are so important. If you do not know the rules and regulations in your school, you may find yourself repeating your research project. And if schools do not document, it now becomes a problem for the researcher. Even organizations, funding institutions, it's important that we know what the rules are before we begin writing our research project. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the need to look at past examples. In research, we say we build on the shoulders of giants. It's important to look at what other people have done. How did they structure their work? Where did they place the introduction? What about the literature review and other sections of the work? What kind of language did they use? What kind of academic pitfalls did they avoid? 
it's important that you examine your subject area. And we're going to dig more into dig when we talk about literature review. It's so important that you investigate what others have done. The primary reason why we investigate other people's work is to find out what has been done so that we can identify a knowledge gap and then seek to fill it. Remember in our first episode, we talked about originality. And that's one of the ways you identify and give your work that edge, that original value, by knowing exactly what is missing and then seeking to fill it. Researchers also need to know the methodologies and traditions that are allowed in their own field. In picking a topic, you need to understand what methods are allowed here and which ones are disallowed. It's important that we know these basic elements. And then you need to self-evaluate. You need to carry out a SWOT analysis on yourself and say, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? Am I good with numbers? Am I going to do quantitative research? Am I good with words? Am I going to do qualitative research? Am I going to blend both? Meaning we're going to do mixed research. It's important you know where your strengths lie, what your weaknesses are. Self-evaluate. What software may I need to know? What kind of, what amount of time do I need here? It's important that we establish all this before we begin to even think about a topic to select. It's so important. There are other things that we have to consider as well. We have to think about the time allowed for final year students or for those doing masters. It's usually nine months to one year, one and a half years. You need to know the time span within which you're required to submit this work or you're working for an organization. You need to know, ask your bosses, how much time have I got to do this research? Because if you don't know the time and then you fall short, that's a problem. Or you don't submit your research on time, it means you didn't complete the program. So it's important you know what time you're allowed to do this work. The second thing is you need to think about the money. Research is expensive. It costs you to print materials. It costs you, for example, in Nigeria, photocopying now, a page is 10 naira. You can imagine if you have to read all this volume of work and you can't read all on the computer. You may need to print some. So think about the cost and all of that so important before you decide on what topic to select. And then finally, you have to think about the resources available. Are there materials to support you? Have other people written on this subject? Are you going to be the first? Do you have access to a library? Do you have people that can help you? Do you have access to the data that you need? Is that organization willing to speak with you? The people you're thinking about having interviews with, are they going to be willing and open to speak with you? You need to think about all of this before you pick a topic. What am I saying here? The right topic, selecting the right topic is the singular most important decision a researcher makes and you can joke with it. Okay, now let's talk about choosing a supervisor. Your research supervisor is that person assigned by the organization you work with or assigned by the institution that you attend or your boss who has given you this task to carry out the research. The supervisor is the person who is supposed to kind of follow you through and provide guidance throughout your research journey. And honestly, and I'm going to share my personal experience, the last thing you need on your plate in terms of worry and concerns in terms of research is to have a bad supervisor. I am so happy and will remain grateful. My experience studying at the University of Huddersfield in the UK, my supervisor, Dr. Messi Ete and Lone Sorensen and Cornel Sanvers, they were simply the best. They were always there for me, provided support every stage. And this is just um, kind of saying thank you to them, especially Dr. Messi Ete. She saw me from beginning to the end. In fact, she even evolved into a big sister to me. So I know firsthand how important it is to have a good supervisor. But listen, once you've decided on your subject area, it's important to immediately start searching for a good supervisor. And these are the three things you want to look out for when you're picking the supervisor. The first one is, are they available? You want to call them up. Even if, for example, you're in Nigeria and you want to go do a program abroad, it might be interesting for you to, if, for example, you've selected the school, or even if you don't know the school, do a bit of digging around the internet and find out and ask people. But once you do within the institution, it's important that you find out who's got the requisite skill in your area, who is available, and what is their knowledge base, because you need these three parameters to be able to judge who is going to be a supervisor, a good supervisor for you. 
It's important that you find out, are they available for the three-year period, for the one-year period, or do they have other projects? Because researchers at that level might be really busy. They always have things to do. So you want to have a conversation with them. I remember I picked up my phone and I called Dr. Mercy Ete and immediately she said, oh, yes, I'm available to see you through the program. So come along. And that was a very, very good thing for me and experience. And I'm encouraging everyone to please do that. Once you decide what university you want to attend, and the course that you want to do or the topic you want to investigate in terms of your research. It's important to find out if you have the right kind of support in terms of supervision within that university. I've heard stories of people going to universities where nobody had any good skill in their area and they had to suffer all through, or midway they were asked to do something else, or they were practically abandoned. So you want to make sure, one, is this supervisor available? Do they know the subject area? Do they know this topic or subject I'm investigating? Will they be able to dig into their own experience and help me? And then finally, you want to know their level of research. What research skills do they have? Because like I said, this is the most important person in your research journey. You want to be able to refer to them. And I'm going to just make a distinction between what students expect of their supervisors and what supervisors expect of their students. It's important that we know both. But on a basic level, before you decide on who is going to be your supervisor, you want to go and find out. Maybe Google Scholar or just surf the internet and find out what amount of work they have done. What areas did they investigate? Are they similar to yours? Are they different? Will, do they have the requisite research skill to support you? It is so important you do this before you choose a supervisor. Other things that you want to know. Students generally expect their supervisors to supervise them. In other words, to be there for them, to provide guidance. They also want their supervisors to read their work well ahead of time. So if they submit like the chapter one or chapter two, they expect their supervisors to do that. Will go through it and then be able to provide constructive criticism, not to knock them down. There are supervisors who I, I've heard so many stories, so many stories. You submit your work to people, they'll just look at it and they'll mark you down or demoralize you or make you feel less important. I mean, nobody knows it all. So most of the times, a good supervisor is the one that will lift you up rather than bring you down. Sometimes, of course. In the course of doing your research, there'll be those days that in, in, in their bid to kind of provide guidance. I remember, for instance, when I was doing my PhD, there were those meetings that I had with my supervisors. I would come back and it was like, oh, the world is over. Am I going to be able to do this? But when you go back and you listen to what they have said to you and you research more, just push yourself a little, you see that, yes, there's still light at the end of the tunnel. Okay. So students also expect their supervisors to be friendly and supportive, to provide that kind of friendly. Sometimes there are days where you feel like the world is over and you just need a shoulder to cry on. And a good supervisor will kind of provide some kind of succor and support. That's not really their job, but because we're all human and there are those days where you're down, sometimes students expect that their supervisors to be there for them. The other thing that students expect from their supervisors is that their supervisors are knowledgeable and will also, in some instances, help them secure jobs. So just, these are students' expectations. Let me now share with you what supervisors expect of their students. The first one is that that student or the researcher is independent. That means you can carry out an independent research. What that means is your supervisor is there to provide guidance, but not to do the job for you. Your supervisor is not going to be the one to go to the library, dig out the materials, um, write the text for you, or even be the one to push your work. You have to do that. And at a certain point, say in your year two or year three of your PhD work, your supervisor is also expecting you to be the one to tutor them or to teach them that area. Because the whole idea is you've identified the knowledge gap in a particular area, and now you're spending all this time investigating that area. That makes you the expert. And so, to some extent, you might actually know better than them. They want you to, some, at some point, start publishing papers with them, like I did with mine. It's, it's so important that you demonstrate to them that you can independently carry out research. And this is the expectation. The second thing that they expect of researchers is that you have regular meetings. It is so vital. It is your work. It is your research. They have their lives. They probably have completed their own research and are on about their business, but you are the one who needs them. So it's important that once you secure a meeting, you've had that meeting. Before you leave, 
make sure you secure the next time for the next meeting. The meeting should be regular, not like oh, every day you're stopping by, but let it be regular. Let there be a clear cut plan on how the meetings and the nature of the conversations. And as you go for those meetings, ensure you take notes down. Then supervisors want their students to be honest about their progress. If you haven't read the text, don't pretend that you have. Just go ahead and read it. If you are not sure that you have a handle on the methods, don't pretend that you do because you'll be doing yourself injustice. If you're given a task and for some reason you're not able to complete it, it's important that you ring up your supervisor and explain yourself. Because, for example, if they say they're expecting your work in two weeks and you don't show up with that task, you're also disrupting their life, their plan, their calendar. So it's important that you please be honest about your progress. And then lastly, oh, everyone, we need to listen to advice. Your supervisor is there to provide guidance and to a very great extent, every good supervisor is really experienced. And so when they tell you to do something, it's important that you listen to them and you do it. You carry it out exactly how they have asked you to do it. If there are any queries, you want to clear it with them. But most of the times, they know what they're talking about. So it's important that you listen to your supervisor, you take their advice on board, and then you carry on. Okay, so these are just a few things that we have to consider uh, when we decide on uh, selecting a supervisor. I talked about availability, I talked about their knowledge base, and then their research skill. I've also outlined here what students expect of their um, supervisors and then what supervisors expect. Marrying these two will help us be successful in our research journey. Okay, now let's talk about keeping a research diary. A diary is so important during your research journey because it basically helps you stay organized. In the same way that sometimes we use social media to document our photos and then when we need them, we can just go there and pull them up. That's the same thing a diary serves in this case. You need either a notepad or your phone or your computer to detail ideas when they just pop up. These kind of ideas, whether they are photographs or just thought patterns or something you hear someone say or what you supervise in terms of the advice that they offer you, you know, it's important that you document it because these are the things that will add extra flavor when you're doing your write-up. It's so important that you do this. It is critical because if you lose any important information, sometimes research takes three years, four years, five years. It's important you have a document that you can also always refer to, whether it's a book that you saw online or a reference style or some information or just a meeting you had with someone. For example, when you're going to see your supervisors, it's important that you document exactly what you're saying or that you record them even so that you can go back home, listen to them again, and then apply what they have said. And if there are any questions, you have the opportunity to go back and clear it up with them. It is critical that we have a diary system. It helps us stay organized in terms of our meetings, helps us stay organized in terms of our thoughts and our ideas, helps us stay organized even when we're writing up, we know the stages where we are. It's important that you keep detailing and you keep recording and you keep keeping records of what you're doing as you progress along your research journey. It is critical that we do this. What have we said in this episode? We have looked at three major things or elements that we consider the first steps of our research journey. The first is choosing a topic or a subject. I have stated here that that is the most important decision that you make because it shapes every other thing that you do. And then once you've selected your topic, you have to think about your supervisor the kind of support or aid that you will get, the right institution, the right person. And you have to make sure that they are available, that they have the requisite research skill that you may need. And then finally, that they have a solid knowledge base of your area. And finally, now I've talked about the need to keep a diary to help us stay super organized. All right, that's it for this third episode, but please remember to subscribe. It's important that you do and engage with content, share, Give us a thumbs up, leave your questions, and encourage others to also subscribe to this channel. Uh, we're going to have the next episodes and then the next ones from there to help us on this journey of having a good idea of what research is and the basic things that we need to know in terms of carrying out our research. Thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure.